gentlemen, remove your hats. Lord, we just thank you for this new day. Help us to rejoice in it. And thank you for all the blessings that you give us, Lord. We want to pray over our prayer book today, filled with names. Lord, and any names that aren't on here, um, you know who they are. So we ask for blessings of comfort over the people in here. And we, many of them have requests, and we ask that you will fulfill those requests for them, Lord. Give them peace and comfort. And for all the people that are grieving right now, this is a time where we have lost loved ones. And we just ask that you comfort those who need your comfort and love. Lord, we also want to pray for our service today and our pastor as he delivers the message. Help it to stay in our hearts and help us to be able to use it out into the world, Lord. Lord, we also want to pray for the other surrounding churches and pastors and that you will fill them uh, with people and give the people a thirst a thirst for you to know to know more about you lord just bring them bring them into church lord i know we have a pandemic still going on lord but help that not be the reason that people are not in church please assemble them together lord and just bring them in. and we thank you for the members and even people that aren't members of this church that are here this morning we also want to pray over our offering that you will bless it um, abundantly and increase it for your glory, Lord. And anybody that doesn't know you today, may they come to know you, Lord, and have you be their personal Savior for their life, Lord. We ask these, all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Sister Wife. <laughs> You're welcome. Appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> well, good morning, y'all. Good morning. Hi, y'all. Good, good, good. Is that Well, we're, I don't, I didn't do it. Well, no, three. There it is. One, two, three, right? I lost count. I didn't have my fingers out there. You know. It's still messing up. Yeah. Do I? Don't move. Yeah, don't move. I don't know. Why don't you turn this one on? We'll just use this one and I'll stay here. Sorry. We're going to try to get all water here uh while he's doctoring me up if you will i want to uh, let you know some good news greg mcdougall made it back to tennessee okay he uh tough time while he was here in texas and uh, he um, uh, was hospitalized, and so he was he was very very sick for a, a period of time. And uh, anyway, he uh, he was still low on oxygen and on and on, and still having troubles. But anyway, he did make it back to Tennessee to his family. So uh, uh, his wife Diane there, or Diane, is taking care of him now. And uh, so, anyway, we're thankful for that. Very, very thankful. Uh, got a request from uh, Billy's family. Uh, we're going to have the service here. Now, I have to say that this is tentatively because I'm meeting with them tomorrow night about 5 o'clock. And uh, uh, we'll find out definitely then. This is pretty loud to me. I don't know about to y'all, but it's pretty loud. Uh, it is? Okay, so if you turn it down just a hair. Um, anyway, we're going to meet with, the, are going to have the uh, viewing here Thursday, tentatively at 11 o'clock, and then the funeral here at 12 o'clock Thursday. Uh, they need two more pallbearers, two more pallbearers. So before you leave today, if two people could, I can't do it because I'm doing the service, all right? 
so if two people will step up to be a pallbearer uh, for that family, it would greatly appreciate it. And uh, then I'll get back with them uh, tomorrow. All right. So if you can fulfill that need, it would be awesome. All right, uh, that's all the announcements that I've had. We're going to have children's church today, so we're going to dismiss here in just a second. Uh, but uh, what, what do we got? Yes, ma'am. What about lunch? Oh, okay. Okay, tentatively. Tentatively. Uh, there's going to be a luncheon to follow. Uh, all I can say right now is that lady right there, raise your hand again, Edie. <laughs> that lady right there. Uh, I don't get into that stuff. I just just benefit from the from the food you know what I mean so so anyway uh, if if you can help with that ladies or a gentleman whichever uh, please uh, get with Edie to help figure all that out okay uh, they are planning on having a luncheon here after the service here at the church so there you go all right uh, with that, I would like to, we are praying church, so we're going to pray another time. Uh, we're going to continue praying. Uh, we believe in prayer. We have seen prayer answered many, many, many times. And uh, so we never stop talking to our Savior. Amen. So let's go with that. We'll, we'll pray up our children's church and, and our, uh, uh, our country, and then we'll uh, dismiss the children, okay? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that we can come into your house and worship you and praise you and glorify you with our presence not that not that we are doing anything except being here to love you and honor you glorify you praise you worship you that's why we're here Lord we're here because we love you and we're here because you first loved us father use us today myself and Miss Terry and whoever's teaching our kids, I think it's Miss Jenny, use us today, Lord, to bring forth the word as you would have us bring forth the word so that it may resonate, take, take seed, take root, and produce a bountiful harvest for your glory, for your kingdom, Lord. Be with us and guide us in all things for your glory. Father, I lift up our administration of our country. I ask, Lord, that you touch that administration and get them on the right track, which is again to glorify you. Father, we do all things for your glory. And we thank you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, your son, who you sacrificed for us so that we may have you in our presence and our presence in you. We thank you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so let's dismiss. If you will, go ahead and open your Bibles to chapter 25 of Matthew. Matthew 25. We're going to be teaching for the next two weeks at least, according to what the Lord has put on my heart, uh, in Matthew 25. And then I think we're going to go back to Matthew 24. Matthew 24 is where Jesus tells us about the end times that are coming. And I think we can look around and see in our world that it's obvious the end times are coming. Amen. Now, I know we have seen and heard this over and over and over and over again. Oh, the, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. Matter of fact, the scripture even tells us that in his day, many people will say, oh, yeah, we've heard that over and over and over. But life goes on just like it always has. Well, it does. It does. Life is going to continue to go on just like it always has. There will be life. There will be death. There will be people born. There will be things happening. It's going to continue on until he comes back. And then it all changes. It all changes. When is that going to be? Not even the son knows. Not even Jesus knew when he walked this earth. Now, Jesus is God. And so, therefore, he does know now because he ascended back into heaven. And he took back his full deity, his full deity. Never was he not God. Never was he not God while he walked this earth. He just did not take any of his deity upon himself for his own behalf. That tells us that over in Philippians 2. But God knows when he is coming back. Amen. And someday. And it can be now. It could be now or now. As each second pass on the clock, it could be now. It may be a thousand years from now. It may be 10,000 years from now. It may be a million years from now. 
we don't know. But Jesus tells us to be ready. Tells us to be ready at all times. We have lost many, many loved ones. I am tired, not that I wouldn't do it, because I, it is my honor and my privilege to serve people by doing their uh, services uh, at their loved ones' funerals. Um, it, it is a great honor for me to do that. However, I'm really tired of doing them. I'm really, not that I'm, not that I'm not going to do it. Please understand me and be with me on this, okay? I would do 10 a day if I had to, all right? But I would rather see people recovering and living and enjoying the life God has promised us, okay? This stinking virus needs to go back to the depths of hell where it came from, all right? It does. But Jesus warns us, you don't know when your time is going to be up. Amen. It is appointed to one at once for, one, for every man to die. Unless Christ comes back, each and every one of us who were ever born is going to die unless Christ comes back and takes us to be with him. But those are only his believers now. Understand that. Those are only his believers. That's who he's taking back to heaven. The rest of the world will go through the tribulation period. Jesus tells us several times in scriptures that that will be the worst time the world has ever and will ever see. You think it's tough right now? Wait till that tribulation period. It'll be far worse than anyone has ever seen. And we taught on, about, taught on that, I think, right around the first of the year. So we taught the whole book of Revelation. And so we understand that in this time, in this life that we are living right now, there's going to be troubles. Jesus tells us that. He says, don't worry about tomorrow because today is going to have enough troubles of its own. Amen. And tomorrow will have troubles too because tomorrow becomes today. The thing that Jesus also warns us about is his false teachers. False teachers. You will have many, many people throughout your life trying to say this, that, and the other and whatever else. What you must know is the Word of God. Amen. This Bible right here. I don't ask you to believe me. I don't ask you to believe anything I say. That's why I say open your Bibles to Matthew 25. I want to show you what I'm teaching on, what God has given me to teach on today is in the Word of God. Now there's a few other things in there that I'm going to add today that is going to kind of relate to it, but it's things that go on in my life and have gone on in my life and in others' lives but the root of the message is always, at this church, is always the Word of God. Because this is the truth. This is the truth. Everything is added to, to accentuate and, and to accent, etc. But this is the message. So if you do not know the Word of God, you're missing the message. You will miss the message. Jesus warns us several times in Scripture to be careful of false teachers. Now, I don't know why he gave me this this morning, but he did. And Clark, you're going to enjoy this. I know Clark very well. And he is a jokester from the get-go. And this is not, this is true and it is untrue, okay? You'll see what I mean in just a minute. All right. In the Muslim world, which we know who the Muslims are, the is Islamic world, okay, they are promised, this is false now, they are promised if they martyr themselves, supposedly for God's kingdom, that they will receive 72 virgin maidens. I can't even handle one wife. <laughs> Why would I want 72? I mean, come on. Also, it is promised that the women will be extremely beautiful and extremely desirable if they martyr themselves. That's why women martyr themselves in that religion. And that is a religion, by the way. It's not a relationship. It's a religion. The women martyr themselves as well, thinking that... Now, look, at the, look at the thinking behind all this. Thinking that they are going to be beautiful, so beautiful and so desirable that their husband, even if, even if they were married two, three, four, five times, 
Because in that religion or in that custom or, or in that, uh, 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 what, do, what do I want to call it, that, um, that country, in that belief, uh, a woman has to have a husband in order to just survive. So if her husband dies, she has to get a new husband, all right? But what it promises the lady who is martyred, if she martyrs herself, quote unquote, for God's kingdom, that she will be the most beautiful and most desirable woman, and she can go and pick the best husband that she had, and he will desire her for eternity. That's what it says. The guy, on the other hand, which makes no sense to me, gets 72 virgin maidens. Why? You know, King Solomon, it said he was the smartest man ever lived. He had 900. I mean, that doesn't sound too smart. Not to me, anyway. But anyway, they are promised 72 virgins. And so they martyred themselves to get the, the glory that, that they're promised, to get the, the prizes, if you will, that they are promised. So, one day this guy martyrs himself, and he is going to heaven, he thinks. And he goes to heaven, and he comes up to the first gate, and who is at the first gate but George Washington? And he stands at the first gate, and he goes... I'm here to get my gals. And George Washington goes, pow! Punches him right on the face and knocks him on the deck. He gets up. He says, wrong gate. He goes over to the next gate. And he's standing there. And then all of a sudden, Thomas Jefferson steps up. Pow! Right in the kisser. Knocks him flat on the deck. <laughs> This ain't the right one either, I guess. So he walks on over to the next gate. James Madison, pow! The next gate. Stephen F. Austin, pow! He said, what is going on here? He goes to the next gate. Sam Houston is there like this. And he goes, wait a minute. What about my 72 virgins? Sam Houston says, it's 72 Virginians. You got 68 to go. False teachings, don't let it lead you astray. You will suffer greatly. You will suffer greatly. He has 68 of them to go. As we go through life, as we go through life as Christians, we think, I just need to get saved and then everything will be fine. If I can just get saved, because that's what I hear all the time. You got to get saved. You got to get saved. Well, once I get saved, then I can just live like I want to. I can just do whatever I want to because I'm saved. I can live like hell if I want to. Many people do. Many Christians do. There's far more to being Christ-like, which is what Christian means, than just being saved. Being christ life. Being Christ-like doesn't stop with just being saved. It means to be Christ-like. We sit there and we think, all I got to do is just get saved, then I get to go to heaven. Well, you know, you're right. You will go to heaven. The problem with it is, if you live like hell, even though you're saved, okay, you miss all the rewards that heaven has to offer. You get to go to heaven, but you're going to miss some rewards. Each and every one of us are going to be judged at what we have done with what God has given us. And we're going to talk about three gifts God gives each and every believer. He actually gives it to each and every person. God created all people, believers and non-believers. And he gives these three gifts to each and every person and each and every person will be judged upon those three gifts. And we're going to talk about them in just a minute. Maybe several minutes. But we must understand to be a Christian is to be Christ-like. That means more and more and more like him. Scripture has, actually tells us, it says, we are to see him as he is and we are to be as he is. That's a big difference between living like hell, right? Jesus never lived like hell, right? Never did, never did. 
So we need to understand that Jesus explains many, many things to us through parables in the Bible. Parables are real life circumstances to help us understand a spiritual teaching. That's what a parable is for. It is a real life circumstance or experience or, or knowledge or wisdom to teach us a spiritual lesson. And so when we get into chapter 25 here, which we're going to in just a second, we're going to see that there is a teaching here about ten virgins. Ten virgins. Not 72, but ten. I'll just take my one wife and I'm fine. Thank you very much. But there's a teaching about the ten virgins, and it's, it's the teaching that we are going to t talk about today and we need to learn from. Now, I want to explain something that doesn't relate to this, but it still relates to what I'm talking about. And you'll see what I'm getting at. Last night, go Rangers, go Rangers, we went to a Rangers game, okay? Love baseball. I coached baseball for many years, and I just absolutely love baseball. And I love going to Ranger game. Win or lose, win or lose, I like my Rangers, all right? I like other teams as well, but I'm kind of partial to the Rangers. Well, I had to buy tickets to go to the Ranger game. I had to download them, which was an issue with me, download them to my phone. I had to call and make arrangements to gather up my oldest son and my grandkids. I had, uh, uh, I had to uh, get our shirts and, and all the stuff, the garb that we wear, you know, go Rangers, you know, type stuff get all that put together and get all that dressed up, you know, so that we could support our team. We had to drive all the way out to the uh, stadium. We had to go in there, go through the gate, you know, do the phone thing. I told the guy, I said, I'm not sure I know how to do this. He said, just do this. There it is right there. Simple enough. I learned something new. We had to go get our goodies, our Cokes and our drinks and our waters and, you know, all the junk that will cost you a fortune. We spent a hundred bucks last night on stuff. I mean, just, it's unbelievable. A bottle of water, six fifty. <laughs> My grandson stays thirsty. What do you do, right? We find our seats, we go do the restroom thing. And we attended a great game. It wasn't a high-scoring game, but if you know a lot about baseball, or really much about baseball, if you follow it, you know there's far more to it than runs, all right? It only takes one run to win a game. To me, it was a great game. We loved it. We got excited. We were jumping up and down, you know, on and on and on and on. You know, like crazy nuts we were. We had a great time. It was a great time. But there was a lot of work that went into getting ready and getting out there to have this great, great time. As a matter of fact, we had to have a ticket to get into the stadium. If we didn't have that ticket, all that preparation that we had done was not going to happen. It was not going to happen. We weren't going to be able to get in and watch the game. Doesn't matter what all we had done, if we didn't have that ticket, we weren't going to get into the stadium. Now, you could have stayed at home, watched it on TV. You could have, uh, if you had the right channel, of course, right uh, cable service. You could have listened to it on the radio. You could have uh, uh, heard about it or read about it in the newspaper. You could have saw it on the internet, or you could hear about it to do, to, from me today. But you didn't go to the game. And even if you had gone to the game and didn't have a ticket, you could have stood outside and listened to the announcer because it's very loud in there. But you didn't get into the stadium. See, there's the difference. You're not in the event. And this is exactly what our scripture today is going to teach us. You've got to get into the event to enjoy the game. There was nothing like being there seated in our seats 
watching the action go, listening to the crowd and the roar and people jumping up and down because somebody finally got on base. It was fun. It was exciting. It was rewarding. It was worth the massive amounts of money it takes to go to a ball game. It wasn't really too outrageous, but it was more than I could afford more than a couple of times a year. But it was great. It was fun. I asked my kids and my grandkids, I said, well, did you like it? We loved it. And so that made it all worth the while. But in Matthew 25, starting at verse 1, Matthew 25, starting at verse 1, at that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The, the foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. They did not prepare. They did not prepare. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. Now, what this is depicting in the real world back then was that when a person, a young girl, was going to get married, the bridegroom would come to the house of the bride, and all of her maidens, if you would, would have torches or lamps, or lamps, and they would do a procession back to the bridegroom's house. That's part of the marriage ceremony. He would come and pick up his bride, and he would take her to his house to be his wife. And then her bridesmaids would be following along with a lighted lamp, okay, showing the way, if you will, or a torch. And five of these young ladies forgot to bring extra oil. Why did they need extra oil? Well, it says the bridegroom in verse 5, the bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. Kind of like, well, Jesus, when's Jesus coming by? Well, I heard he was coming back in uh, January 22nd. I heard he was coming back December the 3rd. I heard he was coming back in 66. I heard he was coming back in 72. I heard he was coming back in 98 or whatever those dates were. Whichever they are, it doesn't matter. My point is, it doesn't matter. The point is, is the bridegroom will come. But yet, they got drowsy and lazy and they went to sleep with their oil lamps burning. At midnight... A cry rang out, here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. Well, when it says trim their lamps, what it simply means is, is they turned their lamps up to guide the way. They had them turned down to where they weren't burning up all their oil, but they turned them up in order to light the path for the bridegroom and the bride to go back to the bride, uh, bridegroom's home, like they were supposed to do. Then the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish one said to the wise, Give us some of your oil. Our lamps are out. They're going out. No, they replied. There may not be enough for both of us. In other words, look, you knew what you were supposed to do. You knew what the word says. You knew what your mission in life was. How come you didn't take care of that? Because you were lazy and slothful. And you said, oh, well, I've got enough. I'm, I'm amply supplied. But yet the bridegroom took a long time to come. And so they ran out of their provisions. They ran out of the oil. They could not do what they were supposed to do. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell the oil and buy it for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom came. He arrived. The virgins who were ready went with him to the wedding banquet. And the door was shut. Lord, the others also, uh, later the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you, I don't know you. I tell you, I don't know you. 
In other words, Jesus is simply saying, look, I have given you everything that you need. Everything that you could possibly need in your life has been provided for you. But what have you done with it? You see, each and every one of us are going to be judged on what we have been given, the believers and the non-believers, on what we have been given while we are in this life alive. And whatever we have done with it is what we're going to be judged for whenever we stand before Jesus. And we all will stand before Christ. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, Jesus is Lord. Everyone will be judged on what they have done with what they have been given. Verse 13 says, Therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day and the hour. You do not know the day and the hour that Christ is going to come back and call you home. Last week, Brother Billy was over at Jenny and, and uh, Robert's house. He was doing what he does. A couple of days later, his day had come. We don't know. We don't know when our day is coming. But we do know this. Our day will come. So we have to be ready at all times. And that's what Jesus is trying to teach us. You be ready to now, today. Now is the day of salvation, Scripture tells us. You be ready right now because you're not promised tomorrow. Over in the book of James, and I believe it's chapter 3, he tells us, he says, we plan for tomorrow. We don't even know if we're going to get it tomorrow. We're only guaranteed this very moment, this very second. We're not even guaranteed two minutes from now. When Billy was driving home that night, he didn't realize he was going to have a heart attack. He didn't know he was, he was, his time was up. It just happened. And it happens every day. Don't think that it doesn't. And it can happen to the young. It can happen to the old. It can happen to the well, and it can happen to the sick. We don't know when our day is done. But we are, and we do know, someday it is. So why not be ready? It's just that simple. Why not be ready? We're going to talk about stewardship next week. And we're going to talk about being ready and doing the things that we're called to do. Stewardship is not just money. We're going to talk about doing the things that we are to do while we are still here today. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that right now. God has given us three gifts. Barbara has it. Kathy has it. Sheena has it. Jenny has it. Yeah, Johnny's got it too. We all have it. We all have these three gifts. Now what we do with these three gifts is very, very, very important. You and I are always called to be ready, always, for his coming. Even if it's not today, even if it's not tomorrow, even if it's not next week, even if it's not a thousand years from now, we are called to be ready. It will be great to be in heaven, but it will be greater still to be in the banquet. Amen. You see, these virgins were in heaven, but they were outside of the banquet. And they were not let in because they did not prepare themselves to do the service they were called to do. Instead, they were lazy and slothful by not getting their own oil to make sure they could accomplish what God has given them to accomplish, which is simply to carry a light to light the way of the bride and the bridegroom. How simple is that? You would think, oh, well, that's pretty easy. Let's just make sure we got enough. But no, they were lazy and slothful. And many, many Christians, I'm afraid, are exactly that way. We get saved. We think, oh, great, I'm saved now. I don't have to do anything. It's exactly the opposite. You're called to do more. We're going to see that next week. Those who are given much will be asked much, much more to do. 
not less to do. I told you a little bit ago, I'm, I would rather do weddings than funerals any day. And I will do as many as I need to do. But I would prefer not to have to do any. But if I have to do them 10 a day, I'll do 10 a day. Because whatever God has given me to do, if he wants me to do more, I'm going to do my utmost to do more. Because I'm here to serve him. I serve you. I serve him by serving you. People call me that I don't even know and ask me to do services for them. I'll be happy to do it. People ask me often, how much do you charge to do it? I don't charge you anything to do it. I don't charge to do funerals. I don't charge to do weddings. I don't charge to, to come in here and share the word. I don't charge to do RCCTV. I don't charge to do Bible study. I do these things because God is letting me do them. And I do them for his glory, not mine. It is my calling and it is your calling, believe it or not, to serve one another. Therefore, you serve God. Not to sit back and be served. Jesus himself said, I did not come. The son of man did not come to be served, but to be a servant to many. And I want to be like Jesus. I know some of you are going, well, you got a long way to go, buddy. And I know I do. I know I do. But you know what? I'm working on it. So the question is, is are you? Not working on me now. Are you working on you? It is very important for us to do the bidding God has called us to do. Each of us will be joy, judged and rewarded on, for what we have done with the three gifts God has given us. I know some of you are saying, well, well, what are the three gifts, man? You talked about it. No, what are they? I'm going to give them to you right now. The first gift God gives you and each and every one of you and me is time. It's time. It's just that simple. God's kingdom is very, very simple to understand. It's time. You have time here on this earth. Now what you do with that time is totally up to you. But you have time. You have time from the moment that you were born until the moment that you pass. My question is, are you wasting time? Are you wasting time? The second gift that God has given each and every one of us is talent. No, I can't sing and dance and all that kind of stuff, but that's not the talent that he's talking about. God has given each and every one of us a certain talent. Now, what is a talent? A talent is a, an ability or a skill. There is something that you do and do very, very well. I don't know what that is, but you do. Are you using that talent that God has given you for his kingdom, to build his kingdom? If you're not, you're wasting your precious, precious talent. Are you kicking back and relaxing and saying, I'm saved, man. I don't need to do anything else. What you're not doing is producing a harvest with the talent that God has given you to produce a harvest with. Not a harvest for you, but a harvest for his kingdom. Because we are here to build his kingdom. The third is treasure. It's treasure. God has given you and me treasure. You say, well, what, what kind of treasure? Do I have a chest full of gold somewhere? Do I have diamonds and rubies? No, but you do have whatever finances you have. Amen. You see, money is a tool. And we're to use money as a tool. Jesus tells us himself, you cannot serve two masters. You cannot love God and love money. Amen. Says in scripture, the love of money is the root of all evil. Not money. The love of money is the root of all evil. So God gives us whatever he proportions to us, whether it be 50 cents or $5 billion, he proportions to us finances, 
What do you do with those finances? I know some people may say, okay, I know what you're saying is now the church needs more money. Keep your money. We, if you'll go to our business meeting, you'll see, you'll see that this church has always been, we've been close sometimes, years ago, but this church is, is very solid. I mean, we're, we're in great shape because we're good stewards of God's money. If your money is given to us with a bad attitude or given to the church because you're actually giving it to God, if you're giving it to God with a bad attitude, please, I'm begging you, keep your money. Why? Because that money is cursed. Scripture clearly tells us that you are to give with a cheerful heart. You are to give of your means, of what you have, not what you don't have. So if you're giving for the wrong reason, please keep it in your pocket. We don't want it. God takes care of his church. Now, if God puts it on your heart to contribute to his kingdom, and again, if you come to our business meeting, the books are open to you. You can, you'll see exactly wherever. That's what Mark was talking about earlier. You'll see exactly where every penny is and where it goes. We, these ladies are awesome. They keep up track. Man, sometimes they're too awesome. They kind of run me over the coals because I didn't bring a receipt or because I'm a penny short or a penny over. I mean, they make sure, it, and, and I love them for it because that's what should be because we must be good stewards of your money. And we are. And that information is available to all of our members. But what are you doing with your money? Oh, well, I get my money and I go out here and give me a case of beer and have a good time. That's what I do. Fine, if that's what you want to do with it. There's nothing wrong with going, get, get, having a beer as long as it doesn't have you. Okay? It talks about beer several, several times in Old Testament and New Testament. Now, I will tell you this. There is nothing good in, uh, that comes from alcohol. Period. I've lived it all my life. There's nothing good that comes from alcohol. If you choose, that's your choice. You don't go to hell for drinking a beer. It does explicitly say in Scripture to be of a sound mind, which means if you dilute your mind with beer or with alcohol or any, anything else, any drugs or anything, then you are not doing as God calls you to do. You are sinning. You are sinning. You are not to dilute your mind and your thinking, period. I used to love the taste of beer and didn't have a problem with it. Prior to many years ago, I had a major problem with it and had to quit all that stuff. Then I got to a point where I'd been away from it for so long, I took a little sip. Now, my, my son, got 20, he came 21 years old. He said, Dad, you ain't never had a beer with me. Have one. Popped a top, took a sip. <laughs> no. And I used to love that stuff, I thought. Simply this. What you do with your money is totally your choice. Totally your choice. Are you going to use it for your self-pleasures? You can do that if you want to. But then who is, who, who are you taking care of? Who are you pleasing? Who are you, who are you living for? You're living for self. Or are you going to use your finances to build God's kingdom? However that may be. However you choose to do it. If you notice on our, uh, on our hand out there, we give to different ministries. We're supporting God's kingdom by giving to other ministries to support their ministry because the ministries that we choose are highly successful in doing great works for God's kingdom. And that's why we give to them. We're not just going to throw it out there because somebody says, hey, I need a bag of groceries. It's not what we do. We're good stewards of God's money, of your money. But what are you doing with your money? Are you a good steward of it? Or are you just spending it on life's pleasures? A lot of people say, Scripture even tells us that people will say in the last days, we'll eat, drink, and be merry and die. That's it. That's all there is to it. Guarantee you it's not. 
Guarantee it's not. There's far more. Eternity is a whole lot longer than your, your tiny little lifespan. And I pray, I pray that you will use your time, your talent, and your treasures widely, wisely for God's kingdom. It's totally your choice. Nobody will make you do anything. Nobody should ever feel, make you feel guilty of doing anything other than what you desire to do. But if you're living for God, if you're trying to be Christ's light, Jesus himself said, I did not come to do my work, but the work my father sent me to do. It's the same thing for you. It's the same thing for me. We're not here to do our work. We're here to do the work God has given us to do, which is to build his kingdom one soul at a time. One person at a time. That is our job. I preach about this quite often. Why? Very simple. Jesus said the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. He had that problem three, almost 3,000 years ago. He had that exact same problem, and we still have the exact same problem today. Our Christians come into the kingdom of God and they said, I'm saved, then I'm done. I'm going to sit on my cloud, play my harp, and eat whatever they eat up in heaven. I don't know. Holy grapes or something, I don't know. No, no, that's wrong. That's wrong. I've said this many, many times, and I hope you will understand it. When I get to heaven, and I will stand before Jesus, don't think that I won't. I'll stand before him just like Robert will stand before him. I'll stand before him just like Johnny will stand before him. Each and every one of us shall stand before Jesus, and we shall give an account on what we have done with what he has given us during our lifetime. And I want Jesus to say, we're going to see this next week. Well done. Good and faithful servant. That's what I want to hear. And do I do it all right? Do I do it all perfectly? Not even close. Not even close. But do I strive to do it better each and every time? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. I did a funeral... Friday morning, Calvin's mother, my best friend's mom, I knew her as mom. I did her funeral Friday morning in a, the biggest funeral home I've ever seen in my life. It was five times the size, six times the size of our church. It was huge. And I mean, it was to the T. It was awesome place. Beautiful, beautiful place. Never met the people there, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, had a great relationship with them, a great time to talk with them. The, uh, one of the funeral directors came up afterward. No boast, no boast, please. I hope you understand that. I never boasted myself. But he came up and he says, you know, we have a lot of ministers. We're basically called ministers. We have a lot of ministers that come through. And he says, you're probably one of the most organized and most smoothly delivered services we've ever had. And I'm thinking, this hick, this old Georgia boy? Are you kidding me? But you see, this is what God will do for you. He'll take that, that sinful, rugged, dirty person and he'll bring you to glory in his kingdom. And again, please understand, I'm not boasting or bragging in any way. I give God all the glory for all things, for all things, especially the things in my life. I've heard many, many, many times in our church, people have come to me and said, since I've been coming here, I have learned more about the word of God, which is my calling, about the word of God than I have ever heard and learned in all the years I have been in church. You see, I'm here to serve. Now, I say this because I'm trying to show you the example of how he can take a dirt road country boy from South Georgia 
and he can build his kingdom by using the filthy rag that I was. That I was. That I was. Because I am a sinner forgiven by grace. And he will use you as much as he will use me because there are no difference in us in God's eyes. He loves you as much as he loves me. He died for you as much as he died for me. The question is, and always is, who is Jesus to you? Is he Lord and Savior, or is he just somebody up in the clouds? Let me tell you, Jesus lives. He is alive. He is well. And he sent the Holy Spirit to live in you and I in order to bring us to his glory. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, if there is anyone here today who does not know Jesus as Lord and Savior, Father, if he can use me, he can use anyone. Father, I thank you for the grace, the mercy you have poured out on me and that you pour out on each and every one of us and the availability that you make for each and every one of us to be a glorious part of your kingdom. And it is all for your glory, Lord, not ours. We lay our crowns at your feet because of what you've done for us. If that's you today and you do not know Jesus as Lord and Savior, and you want to get those crowns, those five crowns that we are promised in Scripture, and take them and lay before the, the, the feet of our Lord and Savior, Jesus, to honor Him, to glorify Him, to praise Him, to worship Him, then you must have Jesus in your heart. You must be a child of the Most High God. There's no middle of the road. There's no, well, I'm kind of a Christian. You are either a believer or you are not a believer. That's the words of Christ. He says, you are either for me or you are against me. There's no middle of the road. So if you've been walking this earth against God, and today is the day that Christ is touching your heart, opening up your heart, melting that hard heart that has lived in you over the years, it doesn't matter whether you understand it all or not. It's simply a matter of whether or not you will accept Christ as Lord and Savior. And if you mean it in your heart and you say that today, then God will take you places you never dreamed of going. Amen. He can use a dirt road Georgia, southern Georgia boy to build his kingdom. He can certainly use you. If that's you today and you want to know Jesus is Lord and Savior, you must say it in your heart and truly mean it. Just simply ask Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me of my sins and thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Come into my life. Be my Lord. Be my Savior today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.